Hello, this is Erica Podest from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and welcome to the final webinar of this advanced SAR series. Today's presentation will be focused on how to generate a digital elevation model through SAR interferometry. The first part will provide an overview of interferometric SAR as related to the information content that's relevant to topography. And the second part will walk you through a demo with a workflow on how to generate a digital elevation model. Our special guest today is Nicolas grunfeld Brook from the Argentine Space Agency, also known as CONAE, which recently placed an L-band SAR satellite in space called SALCOM. Nicolas works for the SALCOM satellite mission focusing on SAR interferometry, and he put together this presentation and demo, which he presented earlier today to our Spanish-speaking audience. His material has been translated into English, and I will be presenting it. However, Nicolas is online with us, and he will be available to answer your questions at the end of this session. He'll do his best to answer in English. However, some questions might have to be translated, so please be patient. The learning objectives of the course are to understand the difference between amplitude and phase of a SAR image and the usefulness of that phase. And in terms of SAR interferometry, understand the concept of interferometric phase and the sensitivity of the phase to topography and surface deformation. Understand the concept of interferometric SAR and differential interferometric SAR techniques, and understand the factors that affect the interferometric phase, such as orbital errors, the atmosphere, and noise. And finally, uh, we'll go through a basic workflow for generating a DM, so you'll understand what needs to be done in order to uh, generate a digital elevation model. To start, we'll cover some of the nomenclature in a SAR image. So the satellite moves in the azimuth direction, and it emits electromagnetic pul pulses at a given frequency. In the case of SALCOM, this would be 2000 Hertz, which is also known as the pulse repetition frequency, or PRF. This electromagnetic pulse travels at the speed of light. It interacts with targets on the Earth's surface, and the energy is then, in part, returned to the satellite, and then an image is formed. In the case of CELCOM, it is a SAR that operates at L-band and has a carrier frequency of 1.3 gigahertz, so that's equivalent to a wavelength of 23 centimeters. The PRF is 2 kilohertz. Its sampling rate is in the range direction, and it's 50 megahertz. And its bandwidth is 50 megahertz as well in the range direction and 1800 megahertz in the azimuth direction. A SAR image has information on amplitude and phase. The amplitude is related to the energy backscattered towards the sensor which is dependent on the characteristics of the surface targets, such as its roughness, absorption properties, and other factors. The phase, which is what we'll be discussing during this course, provides information on the distance between the target and the sensor. So every time the wave moves 23 centimeters, that, that's the length of the wave, it is equivalent to a sinusoidal cycle of the wave, or 2 pi. Given that the wave must go to the target and then return to the sensor, the term 4 pi appears in the phase equation, which relates the phase of a SAR image with the distance to the target. This slide shows what was mentioned earlier, an amplitude image and a phase image. On the left is an amplitude image, and it looks similar to an optical image, even though it's not, but the textures look similar to an optical image. And then on the right is a phase information of a SAR image. To create an interferogram, you need two SAR images that illuminate the same target in the same mode. And this means that the observation angles should be similar. 
Here we have two configurations. On the left is the one usually used to generate digital elevation models with INSAR, while the one on the right is the one used to generate deformation maps with INSAR. So interferometric repeat pass is when the satellite observes the same target in two different points in time, acquisition one and acquisition two. In the image on the left, acquisition one and acquisition two observe the same target from different positions, separated by a baseline. The distance that the wave travels is different between D1 and D2, given the different positions of the satellite. Now, the figure on the right shows that the sensor is located in the same position for both acquisitions, and it now the target is the one that undergoes movement, causing, and this movement can be surface deformation, and this causes the distance between the waves to be different between acquisition one and acquisition two. So we can relate the difference in distance between the waves with the interferometric phase through the equation here, which shows that four pi times the difference in distance between the two acquisitions over lambda is equal to the interferometric phase. In practice, we know that a pixel is formed by more than one subtarget, each one contributing to the signal response within the pixel. So in other words, SAR measures the coherent sum of all of these subtargets within each pixel. In the case of SALCOM, the pixel is 5 meters by 10 meters. And that means that in an area of 5 by 10 meters, there are a large number of sub uh, subtargets with which the 23 centimeter wavelength interacts. The figure on the right, for example, illustrates several subtargets within the pixel. There's a cow, a chicken, a tree, a person, and all of these subtargets are scattering the incoming energy, shown in yellow, back towards the satellite, shown in blue. If those subtargets change between two acquisitions, then the term that corresponds to the interferometric phase of the target will not cancel out, meaning there is no coherence. In this case, you cannot apply interferometry. The first case study is in the use of the interferometric phase to generate digital elevation models. We're looking at the sensitivity to topography using INSAR. In this slide, you can see that the image on the right is an amplitude image, and the one on the left is an interferogram of the same region utilizing two SAR images. Interferograms are characterized by having what looks like contour lines. And these lines, these fringes, relate to the topography of the surface. As mentioned, the configuration needed in order to be sensitive to topography requires that the same surface target be observed by both sensors at different positions. The distance between each observation is called the baseline. Of particular importance is the perpendicular baseline, which is the perpendicular decomposition of the baseline between the two satellites. When observing the same target from two different positions, we can relate the interferometric phase to the height of the illuminate, illuminated target, which is z following the equation shown here. It shows that the interferometric phase is related to topography by the perpendicular baseline term, which is the distance between the two satellites or sensors. The sensitivity to topography depends directly on this distance. In this image, we see three interferograms generated for the same area with different perpendicular baselines. In the left, the perpendicular baseline is 80 meters. In the middle, the perpendicular baseline is 156 meters. And in the right, the perpendicular baseline is 364 meters. As the perpendicular baseline increases, the sensitivity to topography increases as well. However, we can also observe that as the perpendicular baseline increases, the fringes, 
start to get lost as we move towards the right. This happens because as the perpendicular baseline increases, the coherence decreases. Further ahead, there'll be a discussion on coherence. Case study two is about the interferometric phase and its sensitivity to surface displacement. And this is also known as differential interferometric SAR or DINSAR. This image shows an example of a differential interferogram that was generated using Sentinel-1 images over the Cabulco volcano in southern Chile. This volcano started erupting in 2015, and the surface displacement of the volcano was measured to be around 13 centimeters. In order to be sensitive to displacement, the ideal configuration is for both satellites to be in the same position, so that the term that corresponds to the topographic phase is null. In other words, so that there is no perpendicular baseline. So for example, let's assume that we observe a target at two different times, T1 and T2, but from exactly the same position, so that the perpendicular baseline is zero. Now, let's assume that this target undergoes horizontal displacement, as shown in the figure here. We can measure this displacement from the interferometric phase, and in this case, I'll ask, why didn't we include the term related to topographic phase? The reason is because we're observing the target from the same position, and therefore the perpendicular baseline is zero, and the topographic uh, phase term becomes then irrelevant. This is the configuration that we want when generating deformation in, uh, maps. So in practice, it's generally impossible to measure the same target from exactly the same position at two different times. So when we want to make the formation maps, there will be a term that corresponds to topography, which means that there is sensitivity to topography. And in order to measure displacement in such case, then we need to counteract the topographic phase. And to do that, we need an external digital elevation model in order to remove that component from the measurement. Something else to note is that the displacement measured by INSAR is in the look direction of the radar. If we would want to decompose this into horizontal and vertical movement, we would need to observe the displacement from a different geometry. And usually this is done using two images from an ascending pass and two images from a descending pass. In summary, the interferometric phase has two terms. One term depends on the topography of the illuminated area, and the other term depends on the displacement of the targets. The first term is marked in yellow and is the one used in INSAR, and the second term, marked in green, is used in DINSAR. Through INSAR, we generate elevation maps of the surface, while with DINSAR, we generate displacement maps. For INSAR, we ideally need simultaneous acquisitions to ensure that the targets do not change, while for DINSAR, we need acquisitions at different times. The precision obtained through INSAR is on the order of meters, while for DINSAR, it's on the order of millimeters. This is due to the sensitivity to measure topography compared to the sensitivity to measure deformation. Now, in the case of INSAR, the sensitivity depends directly on the perpendicular baseline between the two satellites, the separation between the two of them. In the case of DINSAR, the sensitivity depends on the wavelength exclusively. In INSAR, we need large baselines to have greater sensitivity to topography. However, keep in mind that there is a critical perpendicular baseline, and from there, you lose coherence. In the case of SALCOM, the baseline is on the order of 5 kilometers. With DINSAR, the perpendicular baseline should be very small, or ideally null, so that the topographic term falls out of the equation bypassing the need to use an external digital elevation model.
In practice, the interferometric phase not only has the two terms that are related to topography and the displacement of targets, there are also other effects that appear, and these are due to orbital errors because of not knowing the exact position of the satellites, or due to atmospheric effects or noise. These terms will be briefly explained so that you understand how these factors affect the interferograms and so, so that you're able to identify when they appear and you don't confuse them with actual information related to topography or deformation. The first factor to discuss are orbital errors. So the baseline is the distance between the two satellites at the time of each acquisition. And if we decompose the baseline to its perpendicular and parallel components, then we can describe these as a function of the horizontal and vertical baselines using the sum of cosines and sines. We also know that the interferometric phase is related to the difference in optical path covered between the two waves. This is the parallel baseline baseline, which is 4 pi over lambda. Now, if we take the deriv derivative of the azimuth and range of the interferometric phase and analyze the sensitivities, we can see that errors in the parallel baseline generate an offset in the phase. And this is not a problem. However, errors in the perpendicular baseline result in a ramping of the phase in the range, and errors in the variation in the parallel baseline in time. So this is the same as orbits not being parallel, resulting in ramping of the phase in the azimuth. This figure shows interferograms to which we've applied different errors in the perpendicular baseline and errors in the variation in the parallel baseline to see their effects. The original interferogram was generated with an ALOS pulsar image. We introduced an error of 10 meters to the perpendicular baseline, and we can see that there is a ramping along the range in the horizontal direction. An error in the parallel baseline introduces ramping along the azimuth, which is what the equations in the previous slide had predicted. Here we have an example of a differential interferogram generated for the region of Cordoba in Argentina. You can clearly see that the ramping here is not due to deformation, but rather it's an orbital error due to an error in the perpendicular baseline. If you're not familiar with the type of errors you can find in an interferogram, it'd be easy to confuse what you're seeing here with actual surface deformation rather than orbital errors. Next, we'll discuss errors introduced by the atmosphere. We know that acquisitions are not simultaneous, and therefore the atmospheric conditions are generally different between acquisitions, affecting the path traveled by the wave and hence affecting the phase. The factors that affect the path covered by the wave are humidity, temperature, and pressure. And this produces a term known as atmospheric phase screen, or APS, which describes the small changes in the atmosphere and abrupt changes in time, such as, for example, an acquisition on one day uh, might have had um, clear sky conditions, while an acquisition on a different day might ha have had very cloudy conditions. And so these type of errors have a direct impact in the measurements related to height, especially when the perpendicular baseline is small and we have lower sensitivities, and measurements related uh, directly to, uh, to deformation. Here we have an example of atmospheric stratification. It's a differential interferogram generated with data from SALCOM over San Juan, Argentina. And you can see typical atmospheric stratification effects. There's a direct correlation between topography and the differential phase. So when the interferogram is generated, we assume 
that the wave travels at the speed of light in a vacuum. However, as the wave travels through the atmosphere in regions where there are mountains, the atmosphere, especially the troposphere, will have stratifications, causing the speed of the wave to change, to slow down. This affects the interferometric phase measurement, which can be confused as surface deformation. And these atmospheric effects need to be accounted for. The final term to discuss is noise. To analyze the noise, one of the tools to use is coherence. If the target illuminated between both acquisitions that form the interfer interferometric pair loses coherence, in other words, if the targets have changed substantially, the interferogram will degrade because the phase that corresponds to the target does not cancel out. In the interferometric phase equation, we assumed that the phase for the target was the same in both acquisitions, which canceled out. In this case, they do not cancel out, and there is a term for this. It is possible to quantify this change in the target using interferometric coherence, which is quantified in the equation in the middle of this slide. Values are normalized between 0 and 1. Zero values indicate low correlation, and values close to 1 indicate high correlation. There are several sources of decorrelation or incoherence. We can separate them into geometric decorrelation, Doppler, thermal, volumetric, temporal, and processing. Geometric decorrelation is caused by observing the same target from different positions and incidence angles. This means that we don't observe the same characteristics of the target, and as a result, the coherence is reduced. So there's a critical perpendicular baseline. If the distance between the two satellites is very large, then the characteristics of the target become completely different and the coherence will be zero, and there'll be no interferometric fringes. Another effect is Doppler. This is caused by differences in the centroid Doppler between acquisitions. There's thermal decorrelation, which is related to the system, for example, the antennas and the electronics. There's volumetric decorrelation, which is caused by the penetration of the wave through a dispersive medium. This is frequency dependent. So, for example, at X-band, there is greater incoherence in relation to L-band because of the length of the wave. There's temporal decorrelation, which is caused by physical changes on the surface, which affect the distortion, uh, dis dispersion characteristics. Um, this is also a frequency dependent. And finally, there's processing, which has to do with decorrelation uh, due to, for example, co-registration errors, interpolation, etc. So these are processing steps that we will be seeing later in the workflow in order to generate a digital elevation model. All of these terms are multiplicative. In other words, any of these, if any of these sources of error has zero coherence, then your total coherence will be null. This is a comparison of coherence between two different bands. There are three coherence maps for different temporal and perpendicular baselines generated. The top coherence maps were generated with ALOS2 Pulsar, which is L-band, and that's similar to CELCOM. And the bottom coherence maps were generated with COSMO, which is a SAR data that uh, has an X-band sensor. So here we have uh, two images. Uh, the first one has a temporal baseline of 14 days, that's an L-band, and uh, there's an X-band image on the right that has a temporal baseline of 20 days. And both images have similar perpendicular baselines. So we can see that L-band has a much higher coherence than X-band for the same region. And this is because at L-band, the wavelength is about 23 centimeters, which is much longer than the wavelength at at X-band, which is about 3 centimeters. For this reason, the X-band wavelength will interact with a larger number of sub-targets than L-band. 
And it's this is the reason why X band is more incoherent. Here we have an exercise. Based on what you have seen so far, you can develop a selection criteria to generate a digital elevation model. So let's suppose we have the following acquisition options where we have a graph of the perpendicular baseline as a function of the temporal baseline for 13 acquisitions over the same area. The objective here is to identify the three pairs to select in order to create a DEM, assuming that the critical perpendicular baseline is five kilometers. The result will be revealed in the demo, but the objective here is for you to do this first without seeing the results. Here's some reference material if you want to understand more in depth this topic. There's a radar interferometry data interpretation and error analysis by uh, Ramon Hansen, as well as INSAR principles, guidelines for SAR interferometry, processing and interpretation by the Re European Space Agency or ESA. Uh, in terms of the software that we will be using, uh, we the, there is a Snap, which is an open source software uh, that has been uh, produced by the European uh, Space Agency, and you can download it through the link provided here. There's also other open source software such as Doris, which allows you to generate interferograms. Now we will start the practical portion of this course in how to generate a digital elevation model using SAR images with interferometry. The requisites for this demo are to have a computer with at least eight gigabytes of RAM and have the following software installed. Snap 7.0 with the Sentinel toolboxes and Snafu version 2.0 0.1 and they're both open source software and you can download them through the links that you see here. Our study area is in Jujuy La Cuiaca in Argentina. Here the climate is semi-arid. Summers have about 80% of uh, the year-round precipitation and winters are very dry and cold and it hardly rains. One of the first questions to ask when choosing the pair of images to generate a digital elevation model using INSAR is during what time of year would you want the acquisitions to generate this DM? In this case, given that most of the rainfall is in summer, it'd be best to obtain the images during winter because there will be less atmospheric effects. The data set that we will be using is a strip map tandem pair from Cosmo SkyMed at X-Band. The master image was acquired the 14th of May 2017, while the slave image was acquired on the 15th of May of 2017. The parameters of this interferometric phase are a temporal baseline of one day, a perpendicular baseline of 500 meters, which is equivalent to an ambiguity height of 22 meters, a difference in Doppler centroids of 22 hertz, bandwidth in the range of 73.5 megahertz, bandwidth in azimuth of 2,590 hertz, incidence angle of 40 degrees, a slant range of around 884 kilometers. We saw in the theoretical portion of this lecture that the basic workflow for generating a DEM through INSAR consists in a series of steps delineated here. The first step requires co-registration of the master and slave images to subpixel position. The slave image should be resampled so that each pixel in the image coincides with that in the master image. The next step consists in calculating the interferogram by subtraction. And this is done by subtracting the phase pixel by pixel between the master and slave images after co-registration. 
Afterwards, you must subtract the reference phase of a flat Earth, and in this case, it'd be the phase of the ellipsoid to generate an infer interferogram, where the phase is related to the topography with respect to the reference phase. The next step is reduction of noise by applying filters such as the Goldstein filter or multi and multi-looking. And then you do the phase unwrapping. Finally, you convert the topographic phase to elevation using the equation that relates the topographic phase with the height. And then you project this elevation to latitude and longitude in order to visualize the DM that is projected and to be able to open it in a GIS software. All right, so the first step consists in opening the images with the Sentinel toolbox. So what we do is we click on the directory and then select the master and slave images to open them. Okay, and this is just a common terminology used in the community. Uh, the images will appear on your product explorer window. So make sure you open each of them to ensure that they load it correctly. So you want to visualize each of them. And here we're visualizing the intensity for both the master and the slave. So to see, and, and they both look fine, right? So now to see the interferometric parameters of this pair, go to radar interferometric INSAR stack overview. All right, and then click on Add Opened, and up will pop your two images, the master and the slave. So click on Overview at the bottom, and enlarge the window to see it a little better. And here we can see that the slave has a perpendicular baseline of 481.93. It has a temporal baseline of one day, and it has a modeled coherence using theoretical equations of almost 0 0.6. Its ambiguity height is 21.36, minus 21.36 meters. And so this table provides information on how sensitive this pair of images is to topography through the ba perpendicular baseline. Remember that the shorter the perpendicular baseline, the greater the sensitivity to topography. So now we hit close. And the next step is to co-register the images. So you need to go to radar, co-registration, co-registration. And select add open in the list there. So now you'll see uh, the master and slave images pop up. Select the tab create stack. And the window contains a list of parameters that need to be specified in order to do the co-registration using the orbital information. So this step will co-register the slave image to the master image. Okay. However, this co-registration is not enough. Okay. So this is a coarse co-registration. Um, we net, then need to move on to the cross-correlation tab, which is which is based on correlations between windows. Um, so it looks at correlations between windows from the master and slave images. And it'll co-register the images at the sub-pixel level, which is the level of accuracy really needed to do interferometry. So the cross-correlation co-registration is based on a coarse and fine co-registration. In both cases, the co-registration uses the same technique. However, in the case of the fine co-registration, there is a resampling of the image for greater accuracy. Okay, so keep in mind, the def uh, so keep the default parameters as stated here, but in the case of that the co-registration does not work well, um, what one normally does is to make the window size larger. Okay, so the next step, which is warp, is to is the, the next step to follow. And 
this determines which polynomial will be used to do the resampling of the slave image to the master image. Normally, a polynomial of two is used, is fine, but in this case, we will select a polynomial of three. There are several interpolation methods, but generally the default, which is qubit convolution, works well. So finally, to write, this will generate a file called master underscore stack, and it will be saved in our working directory. In this case, I will change it to where I have my files. So make sure you, you specify where your working directory is. And then you press run. This can take some time. So in my case, this took about uh, three minutes, but it will totally depend on your computer. Okay, and all of these steps are in the PowerPoint presentation that is part of this course. So you can follow this at your own pace. So once finished, we will close the window and we can see that in the product explorer window, our new image master stack appears. And if we click on the directory and open up the images in, in, under bands, uh, we see the intensity image for the slave. Remember that the slave image has been co-registered and resampled to the geometry of the master image. In order to verify that your co-registration was successful, we do an RGB. So right click on the master stack file name and select open RGB. Place the red channel in, as the master image and the green channel as a slave image to visualize the colors. So now if the colors look like this, Predominantly yellow, that means that there is good co-registration because yellow is the sum of both colors, red and green. If you see more of one color than another, then that means that there are problems with the co-registration. In this case, however, our co-registration looks good. Okay, so once you co-register the images, the next step is to do the interferogram which is a pixel-to-pixel -pixel subtraction of the phase of the two images. We go to radar, interferometric products, interferogram information, or interferogram formation, okay? And in the case, in this case, the source product is the master underscore stack. And in the processing parameters tab, keep the default values. The parameters in this window are asking which polynomial you would like to use to remove the phase related to flat earth, which is that of the ellipsoid. A polynomial of five works very well. Do not change this parameter. The number of points to estimate the flat earth is specified as 501 which also works very well. The orbit interpolation degree is specified as three. That works well. So these three parameters are to remove the phase of the ellipsoid to get to the topographic phase. If we click in include coherence estimation, the program will calculate coherence. Okay, so now if you click on square pixel, it means that the coherence estimation will be done using a window of 10 by 10 in the azimuth and in the range. We will leave the default values and hit run. So this step is very quick because it's just a subtraction in the case of the interferogram. And for the coherence, it is an estimate using windows. So in this case, it took seven seconds. And we close the window. And we see the interferogram under mask underscore stack underscore IFG in the product explorer window. Okay, so we open bands. And we want to visualize the phase. We can see here some fringes that are related to the topography of the, rain, the, the terrain. 
Now, the COH image is a coherence image, and if we visualize it, the white colors are areas with greater coherence, and the darker colors uh, close to zero are areas with no or very low coherence, where the interferometric fringe is not well defined and noise predominates. Once again, we go back. Okay, so we see like an area like this. In these regions, there, the coherence is lower and that's likely um, that the fringes are less defined. So the next step is to reduce the speckle noise. And to do that, we apply a multi-look to the image. So to do this, we go to radar. SAR utilities, multi-looking. Under the processing parameters, we select I and Q, which are the real and imaginary bands of the interferogram. And we also select the coherence. The multi-look that we will apply will be with square pixels, so GR square pixel. And we will use a multi-look of six. both in the range and in the azimuth, okay? And now this is equivalent to a pixel resolution on the order of 13 meters. Okay, now we select run, and it quickly generates an image that's master underscore stack underscore IFG underscore ML for multi-look. So we open this, bands, and in this case, you will not see the phase. We need to generate the phase. We just have here the real and ima imaginary part of the interferogram. We will use these two images to generate the phase. And to do that, you right click on the file name and click on band math. Now you select the edit expression on the bottom there. And under functions, select phase. There you go. And in the phase expression, we will now replace the at signs with I, which is the real term, and with Q, which is the imaginary term. This is a complex number. So, and then select OK. We will then name it phase underscore ML. In this case, it's been named in Spanish, fase underscore multi -looked. and select OK. So, we now have the phase and we see the phase as black and white. You can change the colors by going to the color manipulation tab on the left, on the bottom left, and select basic and select the color range such as the spectrum cycle. So what you're seeing here is the interferometric phase colored with a ground range, or sorry, with a, a pixel resolution of on the order of 13 meters. So now the next step is to apply an adapted filter. And in this case, we will be applying the Goldstein filter. And to do that, we go to radar, interferometric, filtering, Goldstein phase filtering. All right, so the input image is the multi-looked image. And under processing parameters, the parameter that determines the level of filtering is the first one. So the adaptive filter exponent, which goes from zero to one, 
One is the maximum filtering and zero does not apply the filter. So we'll leave the default values, but you can play around with this parameter. All right, and now we'll hit uh, run. And this step is very quick. All right, so now we have our interferometric phase that is multi-looked and it's filtered using the Goldstein filter. Okay, so we open it and we open the phase. All right, so you can see that it has been filtered. And the next step now consists in unwrapping the phase, which has what's called two pi ambiguities. Notice that the phase goes from uh, red to blue and red again in some places. So here you see red, blue, and then red again. These ambiguities have to be unwrapped to then be able to convert that unwrapped phase into topography. So the phase unwrapping can be done with Snafu, that's a, a, a software, uh, you, you can run it on Windows. Um, Nicolas works with the Linux in Ubuntu. And so what he has done is he's exported the image to Snafu and then run the unwrapping there outside of Snap. Okay. So we need to, and then that result is then imported into Snap to proceed to the next step, which is to convert the topographic phase to elevation. So to unwrap the interferometric phase, you click on radar, interferometric, unwrapping, Snafu export. And we select the filtered phase through multi-looking and gold stain. Okay, and under Snafu export tab, the statistical cost mode, we select topo. The default is defo, which is for deformation maps. And under target folder, I will select the folder um, where all the files are for this demo. And I'll specify Snafu as the file name, but you can name it as you wish. In number of tile rows, I will select one and one because the image is not very large. So he will process the entire image. However, based on your RAM, you can make this smaller. The other parameters are kept as default. And for all of these parameters, there is a help button in Snafu that provides information on each of them and you can play around with each of them. All right, so we hit run. And the exported file will be in a directory that will open separately. So now we go to Linux. And go to the directory where the output file is located. Now, the file that was generated is called snafu.conf, C-O-N-F extension, okay? And so at the top of the file, when you open that file at the top, is the command that needs to be run in order to do the phase unwrapping. Here you have it. So you want to copy that command. And then take that and go to the terminal and to the directory where the archive is located. and you run this command, you paste it and you run it. Now, this step can take a long time, depends on your computer, um, around 30 minutes. So uh, don't panic, be patient.
In this case, it was fast because the image was heavily multi-looked and it was filtered. However, if the image is less filtered or multi-looked, it will take longer. And once the process is finished, you'll find in the Snafu directory the unwrapped image. Here we have un UNW phase. Okay. So the file name will be unwrapped underscore IFG. And then there are two files, one with a .img extension, which is your actual image file. The other one has a .hdr extension, um, which is the header file. And what we do is we go now to snap. We return to snap and go to radar, interferometric, unwrapping, snafu import. And in the first tab, leave the default as is, which indicates a source product. In the second tab, we need to specify the unwrapped phase image, and we select the header file, okay? This unwrapped phase image, the one with the .hdr extension. So unwrapped.hdr. In the third tab, we leave everything as default. So we want to write, we want to save the wrapped interferogram. And then in the fourth tab, we hit run. And we overwrite our current multi look and Goldstein filtered. All right, so that goes very quickly and we open the new file which is the unwrapped file so it's the last one here and once we have the unwrapped phase what is left is now to use the formula of the interferometric phase that relates the topography with the interferometric phase we saw this in the theoretical part but this is done by going to uh, radar interferometric products phase to elevation and in the phase to elevation processing parameters a tab we have a parameter asking which DEM we want to use in this case the default is SRTM 3 arc second which is automatically downloaded so this is used to relate the elevation of the interferogram after unwrapping to actual elevation. So the term that relates the phase with the topography produces elevation values that are relative, but not actual values of elevation. We use the DM to tie down these relative values to actual elevation values. Okay, so we click on run. And this should go pretty quickly. Close the window. Open our new file. Now that's the DM. Elevation. We visualize the elevation image. It looks beautiful. And this image has elevation for each pixel relative to the reference surface, okay? So this is a digital elevation model. However, this is in the radar imagery or projection or, or, or slant range projection. Um, so, it, sorry, it's in the radar geometry, satellite geometry uh, slant range. And so we need to put it in the ground range projection in order to visualize it in things like Google Earth or in a JIS type software. So in order to do the geometric correction, uh, we need to go to radar. And under radar, select geometric. Terrain 
correction, range Doppler terrain correction. So under processing parameters, we will use the SRTM 3 arc second DM once again. And all the other parameters we leave as default. In the input output parameters tab, we make sure that the source is the DM that we generated. And we leave everything else as is. And then we click run. And this step is also uh, very quick. All right, so now we have our latest product. This is in a ground range projection, terrain corrected. We visualize the DM projected to the ground range, okay? And we can see the coordinate values in the bottom right. They are in latitude and longitude. As we move the cursor around the image, you can see the lat long. And now you can export this image into Google Earth by right-clicking over your image and selecting Export. as Google Earth KMZ. Here I, I select the directory where I've been working. We select OK. We overwrite because I've generated this already. So it's just overwriting it. And now we go to the directory where this file has been saved, this KMZ file. And we double click on it to open it on Google Earth. OK, there it is, KMZ. And note that the elevation matches what Google Earth is indicating. So, and you can also export this into other formats that where you can open this on a, on a GIS type software. So these are the basic steps to generate a DM with SNAP using an interferometric pair. The methodology explained here is a basic workflow, and there are some limitations. Remember that the, during the theoretical uh, part of this um, webinar, the interferometric phase uh, was written as the sum of terms referred to by the equation that you see here. One term relates to the topography, another term relates to the displacement of the surface, another one to orbital errors, another one to atmospheric effects, and then another one to noise. In this demo, we did not account for or orbital errors or atmospheric effects. The orbital errors can be visualized as errors in the perpendicular baseline, and they manifest as ramps in the range direction in the interferogram. Errors in the variation of the parallel ba baseline, in other words, orbits that are not parallel, they manifest themselves as ramps in the azimuth direction. On the other hand, errors due to atmospheric effects can be small spatially, but they can vary in time. And these terms would have to be removed if we wanted to create a DM with greater accuracy, and we have not done that here. So we assume that the measured interferometric phase was solely due to topography plus some noise, which we reduced through filtering. We've considered other terms as null. So in a way, this is not completely off because the pair we used was a tandem pair with one day in between acquisitions. And the study area is a very dry region. We also assume that there was no surface displacement between the images. This is a correct assumption since we know that there were no seismic movements between the image acquisitions. There were also no obvious orbital errors, nor did we see strange fringe ramps in either the range or the azimuth. So this assumption seems to be correct too. 
Now, if we wanted to generate a DM with higher accuracy, we would have to somehow account for all of these other effects. And you normally do this not with a pair of images, but rather with a stack of images and with more advanced techniques, such as SBAS or PSI permanent scatterers. Uh, perhaps this is a topic for future training. But with that, you can follow a basic workflow that will allow you to create a DM. And you're now aware of some of the errors that might be introduced into the DM and how these errors might look like. So thanks everyone. And before we start the Q&A session, I just wanted to remind you that there is a homework assignment associated with this training. It's due on January 8th and you can access the homework through the link that you see here on the page. And the link is also on the chat window. So with that, uh, I conclude this presentation and I'd like to thank you very much and we're now open to our question and answer period. Great, so let's get started with the question and answer session. Uh, we have Nicolas Grunfeld online and he has started answering some of the questions that you've been posting already. Remember, the process here is for you to write your questions in the questions window and we'll be um, going through them and answering each of them. So Nicolas has answered in Spanish. I will be translating into English. And so this process might be a little slower than normal. So just uh, be, please be patient and uh, we'll try to get to everything. All right, so let's start with the first question. Is it possible to get SAR images in this tutorial? From these steps to generate a DM. So the data that were used here are proprietary. However, Nicolas is looking at um, getting access to these images and posting them. However, you can use Sentinel-1 images. So what he presented here was a step-by-step -step workflow on how to generate a DM. And Sentinel-1 images are open and free. So you can use those um, as well as ALOS uh, uh, Pulsar data which are also open and free. The actual question number one, same target, two different positions. Is it necessary to be taken at the same time or it could, could it be different times? Uh, Nicolas indicates that to generate a, a DM, ideally, you would want the observations at the same time from different positions. So in this way, there is no temporal decorrelation or atmospheric effects. The SRTM DEM was generated using this type of con configuration where there were two antennas separated by a fixed baseline. One antenna would emit an electromagnetic pulse and both of them would receive the, the scattered signal. Normally, however, you just have one antenna and you have to do repeat pass. That means uh, you observe the same point at different times. And when you do this, you have to account for different sources of errors, like, uh, like a baseline or atmospheric effects. I'm, I'm sorry, um, you, you have to account for different sources of, of errors, such as atmospheric effects. 
question two, what is an applicable coherence value and guidelines to determine the quick, critical perpendicular baseline? Okay, the critical baseline is the perpendicular separation for which the geometrical coherence becomes zero. So the critical perpendicular baseline is equal to lambda times BW, the range, times slant range. So there is a formula that's being written here that indicates that critical perpendicular baseline. So what are all the, the factors that account into that critical per perpendicular baseline? Okay, question number three. Where would you obtain better results if you use more than two images? So Nicolas indicates that in the case of using a stack of images, you can better remove the atmospheric effects and orbital effects utilizing more advanced techniques, which are beyond this course. But these techniques remove the effects of the atmosphere, knowing that the atmosphere can be very variable through time. And the effects because of orbital errors are also removed, knowing that these can generate ramps in the azimuth. And that's due to um, errors um, because the orbits are not parallel. And also uh, errors in the range. So that would be the errors in the critical perpendicular baseline. So if you have a stack that is large enough, you can then estimate each of the terms in the interferometric equation in a statistical way. And you can separate each of the contributions. Okay. So the next question is regarding master and slave. What does this mean? The master is yeah. the reference image. So everything is really uh, registered to the master. And then the slave are the images that you are registering to the master. Or you're, so master will always be the reference. En el caso de DEMS, no importa cuál es el master y cuál es el slave. O está sacando alturas, no está viendo desplazamientos. Ok, so in a case of a, a DEM, it doesn't really matter which one you uh, specify as a master and which one you specify as a slave. Lo que importa uh, es ver el baseline perpendicular que hay entre las imágenes. Tiene que ser... Eh, lo suficientemente grande para tener eh, sensibilidad a la topografía y que el tiempo entre las imágenes no sea muy grande para que no haya efectos temporales. The, the important part is to have a large enough base, perpendicular baseline between the images so that you have a large enough sensitivity to topography. And la separación temporal no muy grande para que no haya efectos de correlación temporal. And, and also you want to make sure that the temporal separation between the acquisitions is not very large so you don't have any decorrelation, uh, temporal decorrelation due to, for example, things like atmospheric effects. Eh, hay, hay convenios. Eh, yo puedo ponerlos en contacto con las personas adecuadas para, para averiguar esto, eh, el tema de la data policy y demás. Ok, great. So this is in relation to question six. Um, it, someone stated 
it's that they're very interested in using CELCOM images. How can I get the data? And Nicolas indicates that if you send him an email, put you in touch with uh, the the right person. Uh, there are some agreements that uh, need to be um, established, but um, it might be possible for you to um, get access to the data. So the next question, I've tried to create DMs on forest area, however, the payment is very low. Do you have suggestions sí. to solve this? In este tipo de areas, eh, en los cuales hay, hay mucha de correlación volumétrica, porque la onda interacciona con los, las ramas, con los árboles, con un montón de cosas, entonces entre dos, entre dos escenas cambia mucho la, lo, que, lo que ves. Contra la decorrelación de este tipo. So, he's saying that in areas where there is dense vegetation, uh, you tend to have high decorrelation, okay, because of uh, changes in these areas in time. And so the best way to try to avoid this decorrelation is to use a longer wavelength, such as L-band. No, implica igual que que den resultados, puede que no, que no funcione por, por, digamos, por la interacción que tiene la onda en este tipo de medios. Right, so even then it might, it's possible that it might not work that well, and it has to do with wave action with the features on the surface. So the next question, why do we need the DM after the phase unwrapping to find the elevation? Usamos el DEM porque cuando hacemos el phase unwrapping, las fases están eh, flotando, no están referidas a nada. Entonces, para poder hacer que la altura coincida, un, tenemos que hacer que alguno de los puntos de altura coincidan con una altura real. Y después, el resto de las alturas van a quedar bien referidas. Ok, so you do it because... Uh, you don't have a reference. Basically, the the face is floating. There is no reference. So you use a DM as a point of reference, and to you you tie that point of reference then to have um, actual value the rest of uh, your pixels. The next question: Why? Uh, let's see, what is the vertical elevation accuracy we can expect processing Sentinel C-band? Eh, no estoy muy acostumbrado a usar Sentinel yo, pero el, la, la precisión que vas a tener depende un poco de la, del filtro que apliques, eh, del ruido que tengas, del multilook que le apliques y demás, a costas de pérdidas en resolución espacial. Okay, so Nicolas is telling us that he's not familiar with uh, Sentinel he, data, Sentinel-1 data, but that it would ultimately it would depend, the accuracy would depend on the filter that you use, the, the noise, the multi-looking. A medida que filtras, vas a, vas a ganar precisión en altura pero vas a tener menos resolución espacial. So, as you uh, filter, the more you filter, you gain accuracy in the elevation measurement, but you lose uh, resolution. Spatial resolution. Espacial. Okay, so the next question. Are there any plans on a training course teaching SPAS PSI? Uh, possibly. It's good that you mention it, and uh, it's always good to know what the community is interested in. So this is something that we'll consider for future trainings. Question 11. Can you talk a little on the response time given we request interferometric in main SAR satellites? both for archive, catalog, and new acquisition. I think you're referring to the latency in terms of how quickly you can 
obtain images. And for Sentinel-1, I believe the European Space Agency Copernicus posts Sentinel images within a day. Um, so, so you can access images from 24 to 48 hours, uh, but you'll have to check. The Alaska Satellite Facility also has as a subbase, however, uh, it's it's a little the delay is a little uh, larger there in the image being posted. So for the latest Sentinel One images, go directly to the ESA Copernicus uh, website. Question twelve: What are the advantages of INSAR generated DM in comparison to Aster generated DM? No sé bien qué es Aster, o nunca lo usé, pero no es que uno es mejor que otro, sino que son como técnicas complementarias. Eh, el objetivo final es siempre tener un, un DEM, ¿no? un modelo digital de elevaciones. Eh, es una técnica para obtener un resultado que es el mismo. Eh, right. o sea, so, el resultado final. Pero... Uh, Uh, that familiar with Aster, however, these are complementary techniques. These are different techniques, and uh, you're generating uh, a traditional elevation model. With Aster, I do know that some of the issues um, has been uh, cloud cover. Uh, so that is an optical sensor, and that's always a challenge that you'll run into when using optical uh, sensors is uh, cloud cover. Question 13, is core optical image with respect to a SAR image possible? Um, it, yeah. Es posible it utilizando is. información eh, orbital. Sí, se pueden corregistrar. Yes, register them. You need to have the uh, orbital information in order to accurately be able to co-register them. Question 14, with the resolution, the horizontal and vertical resolution of the DM from INSAR be equivalent to the DM used during the face to height conversion? Okay, so the DM that was generated here has a resolution of 10 meters, right? 10 meters? Sí. Sí. And And the SRTM is, has a resolution of 90 meters, a spatial resolution of 90 meters. The next question, 15, can you give some insight about graph creation and atmospheric phase screening correction? Por lo que entiendo, eh, no sé, estos gráficos creo que se refiere a los graphs de, de SNAP, ¿no? Sí. sí. Eh, tengo entendido que el SNAP se comunica con otro software que se llama Stamps, que es para hacer técnicas de SBAS y de, de Stacks, con las cuales uno podría remover los efectos atmosféricos. Ok, so SNAP can be interfaced with a software called Stamp, which has uh, certain techniques of um, SBAS and, and statistical analysis um, options. Now, the, sec the sequence to follow here is to create a stack, an interferometric stack, re reference to master, and export this then to stamps for analysis, or to create these, um, the, the graphs that you're uh, mentioning. Question 16, I did not get good quality IFG Interferograms by INSAR due to topographic problems. Approach by PSI would be useful for creating a DM. La, el PSI o Permanent Scatter Interferometry utiliza píxeles que tienen que cumplen ciertos criterios de permanent, que son los permanent scatterers. Entonces no va a tener una, una un, quizás una topo, una altura a lo largo de toda la imagen, sino que vas a tener diferentes puntos con alturas. La técnica de PSI generalmente se usa para monitorear el desplazamiento que tienen, por ejemplo, en ciudades, los edificios a lo largo del tiempo. 
o las, o las obras construidas por el hombre, que son las que mantienen esta... Ok, so PSI uh, takes pixels that meet certain criteria. So you're not going to have elevation in the entire image, but just certain points. So basically, PSI works in areas like urban areas where there's not much change. Remember, it's permanent scatters. Um, so it does in areas uh, that might have some change, like in natural areas. Uh, question 17. It's mentioned that the perpendicular baseline for INSAR must be large, while for DINSAR should be small. How about for time analysis INSAR, such as PSI, uh, permanent scatter INSAR, and SBAS? Bueno, en el caso de SBAS, SBAS significa Small Baseline Subset. En este caso, de, la, de todas la, las combinaciones de interferogramas que que tenemos en el stack de imágenes, se seleccionan los que tienen baseline chicos para tener mayor sensibilidad a la deformación. He's saying in this case, uh, this, the images here that we use have a small baseline. The, the SBAS, which is a small baseline, that's uh, it. You use a combination with the small baseline. For PSI, the baseline separation doesn't matter. You're looking more at permanent scatters that do not change. Uh, so question 18, we need a DM to generate a DM. What if we had no prior existing DM for our ROI? Para generar un DEM se usa para después poner las alturas a la, para pinchar las alturas y que queden referidas a, la, a las alturas correctas. En el caso de que no dispongamos de un DEM en la región que trabajamos, tendríamos que generar alguno, por ejemplo, utilizando este tipo de técnicas, y después, eh, de alguna manera... Eh... Ok, so you use a DM to reference elevation. So remember, it, you, you just have, what you're producing is, is a, a, has floating values. You, you're not really to actual elevations. And that's where the DM comes in, with actual elevation values. Um, now, if you don't have a DM, then you probably would need like institute where you know what the elevation is to pin down the the DM that you've created. So you you have some reference points um, that you can then tie that the elevation to those reference. If we need to make a DM of a region with different climates, should we look For the best climatic conditions to do the acquisitions. So, when you're you're planning the acquisitions, you always want to plan for the the optimal collection for the optimal images. Um, in the case of images that are already collected, they're in a database. Uh, you you want to make sure that um, you've got the the best climatic conditions for the images that you select. The next question, what alternative the, um, to tie up the unwrapped no phase elevation relative to ground elevation? Y hay alguno, hay bastantes DEMS. Eh, yo normalmente utilizo el SRTM porque es libre pero entiendo que hay otros tipos de DEMS. No, soy, no, no los conozco todos, pero eh, creo que en el SNAP te da opciones de usar otros. So, uh, there are several other DMs. In fact, SNAP has a number of options for different DMs that you can use. Uh, there is an Astro-derived DM, too, for areas outside of the SRTM coverage. And SNAP also has the option of you uploading your own DM. All right, so the next question, do the steps for processing shown here apply to Sentinel-1 DM? 
Sí, los pasos son los mismos. La única diferencia es que creo que Sentinel tiene baselines normalmente chicos. En ese caso vas a tener poca sensibilidad a la topografía. Y son, eso va a ser un problema. Pero si conseguís Bayland Grindes, eh, los pasos son exactamente los mismos igual. So the steps are exactly the same with uh, Sentinel One. The only issue with baseline is that it tends to have very. Uh, the only issue with Sentinel One is that it tends to have very small baselines, uh, which uh, would mean uh, low sensitivity to topography. However, if you can get large baselines, images with large baselines, then um, you'll have uh, good results. So it's just a matter of applying the same steps that you saw here. Okay, so the next question, how can I download Sentinel-1A polarization? Uh, you can download Sentinel-1 data through the Alaska Satellite Facility. If you download interferometric swath, uh, wide swath mode images, the polarization comes in VV and VH. And yesterday's, uh, sorry, the first webinar um, of this series discussed uh, looking at flooding with Sentinel-1 images using Google Earth Engine. And that also shows you how to query the Google Earth Engine Sentinel-1 database. And you can query for either one of those polarizations. It's VV and VH. Okay, question 23, does SNAFU need to be run in Linux? Creo que en las versiones de el SNAP, en la última, podés ejecutar el SNAFU desde Windows. Yo como no uso Windows, normalmente no, 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 no sé, pero creo que una de mis compañeras lo ha hecho. So, Nicolás uh, indicates that He, he doesn't use Windows, he's primarily a Linux user, but he thinks that the latest version of SMAP does run in Windows. Question 24, would it be possible to detect urban destruction after an earthquake or bombing by comparing change between subsequently computed DEMs before and after? Urban Destruction, eh, mira, para ver movimientos o ese tipo de, de, de mapas, lo mejor es hacer de insert, no generar DEMS y después compararlo, sino que usar de insert y ver los desplazamientos que tiene la, que tiene la fase, la, la, el terreno a partir de la fase de interferométrica. So si uno quiere best... después ver destrucciones, que la... Que la Perdón, si uno quiere ver, no sé, que algo se destruyó, podría ver la coherencia y, y con eso ver que... No, 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 solamente, sí, de insert, perdón. Ok, so the best way for this application, the best technique is differential interferometry, because there you, you really do want to look at surface deformation. And so DINSAR is sensitive at the centimeter scale, right? And... Yeah. Pero no vas a ver eh, urban, destrucciones de urbanas, no vas a ver, vas a ver movimientos de mientras que la, el target que estás iluminando tenga la misma forma y no, se, no haya cambiado, no se haya destruido, se haya desplazado nada más, lo vas a poder medir. Si se cambió totalmente porque se destruyó, las imágenes no son coherentes y no vas a ver fase para ver desplazamiento. Ok, so um, if the target is has completely changed, then you'll, you will not have any coherence. So one thing you can do to look at, say, um, uh, destruction is to look at coherence or, 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 or decorrelation over certain areas or the incoherence. So question number 25, is the phase delay due to atmospheric disturbance much less in L-band compared to 
T and X bands. Cada una de las bandas tiene diferentes efectos con diferentes layers de la atmósfera. En particular, la banda L está más afectada por la ionosfera. Pero no implica que va a tener menos o más, sino que interacciona con diferentes capas. So the different wavelengths interact with the different layers of the atmosphere. Um, so each of these is going to have um, a, some issues, some sort of interaction with the atmosphere. Do the phase delay due to atmospheric disturbance is very less in L band compared to C and X band. Y esto es más o menos lo mismo que respondí en las dos preguntas arriba. Exacto. So this is similar uh, to the, the res previous response. All of these are going to interact with the atmosphere. In some way or another. Which one is better for generating the vertical movement? So the the accuracy with the, within with these two is uh, very different, right? So with Dinsar, when you're looking at displacement, you're looking at an accuracy of on the order of centimeters. Um, with uh, Insar, with the interferometric phase, it's on the order of meters for looking at topography. Okay, the next question. There are so many sources of errors and factors of decorrelation. How to minimize these problems before conducting processing? It's a very good question. Y en el caso de que usemos un par de imágenes como fue en este curso, la única manera que tenemos es buscar las condiciones climáticas que sean las adecuadas para que no haya errores, por ejemplo, atmosféricos. Okay, so the best way The, the best thing you can do is to choose your images based on climatic conditions, images that are relatively close in time, and then there are orbital errors. So even though orbital uh, introduce ramps, so even though you can't really control these orbital errors, there are ways to remove uh, the ramps. And that's for the case of using two images, which is um, the demo that was shown here today. Could you tie in the INSAR DM to benchmark data? So, uh, so benchmark may, da data means a known elevation reference point. Um, yeah, so this is exactly what you want to do. You want to tie your, your DM to a, a reference data set, a benchmark data set, a data set where you know the elevation values are correct. Um, And this data set can be another DM, like an SRTM DM, your own DM, or it could be in situ points where you know the actual elevation for that point. Is the DINSAR technique only valid for centimeter level displacement? For example, phase unwrapping ambiguity cannot be resolved when elevation changes are too large. En el caso de interferometría diferencial, uno puede hacer el unwrap de la fase y obtener desplazamientos finales, digamos, sin ambigüedad. Sin embargo, también lo que se puede hacer es contar la cantidad de, de franjas que hay y después eso hacer la cuenta y llevarlo a, a desplazamiento. So in the case of Dinsar, you do the phase unwrapping, then you have displacements. You can count the fringes and then determine Uh, what your displacement was based on. Okay, question 32. What is the final output from the preview? Is it a digital surf, surface model or digital terrain model? Es un eh, modelo digital de elevaciones referido a la fase de referencia, que en este caso fue el W, que es 84. Eh, y las respuestas son las que la banda X llega hasta donde llega a penetrar la banda X. No sé bien cuál sería la diferencia para, para, no sé, para ustedes entre DSM y DTM, pero la banda X tendríamos que ver hasta, hasta qué profundidad llega y en función de eso discriminar a ver si es DTM o DSM. So, 
so this is completely dependent, obviously, on the wavelength, um, because the longer the wavelength, the penetration, right? So if you have vegetation and you have a longer wavelength, you're penetrating through the vegetation. You're seeing more of the actual rain rather than the top of the canopy. Um, in this case, X-band was used, and in a, this is a desert type area, so uh, no little or minimal vegetation. So what we're actually seeing in this case is the the actual terrain. Okay, so that's it in terms of our Q and A session. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining. A really special thanks to our guest speaker today, Nicolas Grunfeld from CONAE, from the Argentinian Space Agency, for this excellent presentation. You'll be able to access the recordings and the presentations online. And also remember, there is a homework associated with this webinar series, and that's going to be due on January 8th. Um, I'd like to thank the, the organizers of this webinar, since this is the last of the three parts uh, in the series, organizers Brock Blevins, Selwyn Hudson Odoi, um, uh, Sean McCartney, who has together, David Barbato for the translation. So there's a, a very large RSET team uh, that's been working on getting everything uh, together. So thank you to them and thanks to you. Any questions, any additional specific questions, you can send me an email, send Nicolas an email, and we'll try to um, get back to you. Okay, so stay tuned uh, for other RSET trainings. Um, our RSET is on social media, on Twitter, or go or sign up to uh, receive RSET emails about upcoming trainings. We will have another SARC next year, and we will be announcing that. Uh, way ahead of time. A great day to everyone. Thanks and bye bye. Thank you, Nicolás. Gracias, Erika. Gracias a todos, Arcet.